Coming up on the Threat Status Podcast, we talk to former Israeli intelligence official Avi Malamed about the apparent Israeli pager operation targeting Hezbollah in Lebanon and whether the two sides are headed for an all-out war. And then we dive into America's seemingly endless military involvement in the Middle East and examine the sensitive issue of foreign funding and malign influence at top U.S. universities. Don't forget to go to WashingtonTimes.com and sign up for the daily Threat Status Newsletter. Hello and welcome to the Threat Status Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Wolfgang. National security correspondent at the Washington Times, and I am joined as always by my esteemed co-host, Guy Taylor, national security editor here at the Times. A good show today. We'll be talking to Avi Malamed, a former Israeli intelligence official and author and an analyst about the apparent uh, Israeli pager operation that targeted Hezbollah last week and the prospects of a full scale ground war between the two sides. So we'll dive into all of that with Avi a little bit later in the show. But before we get to that, as always, Guy, first things first, what's on your radar right now? Thanks, Ben. It's great to be here on the podcast once again. One thing off the top has to do with the intersection between intelligence and politics and how dicey it can get if raw intelligence gets politicized by elected officials or by politically appointed officials. What's caught my eye this week is the kind of brouhaha going on in Washington over the FBI's probe into the two assassination attempts against Donald Trump. While both of these incidents appear to be uh, lone wolf, white male wannabe assassins, there is a narrative circulating that somehow a foreign hand could have been involved in some way, particularly given that federal law enforcement has indicated over the past few years that Iran poses a very real assassination threat to some high-level American officials, most notably former Trump administration officials who were involved in authorizing the U.S. drone strike that killed Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani back in 2020. Former President Trump has made headlines by claiming he's been briefed by intelligence officials about Iran's efforts to assassinate him. Why he would go public with this uh, now is debatable, to say the least, but it caused a media stir And President Biden's Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, found himself being asked about it during an interview with NBC, during which Mr. Blinken made the interesting comment that the U.S. has been very intensely tracking Iran's threats to assassinate senior U.S. figures. He said, uh, quote, including former government officials like President Trump, end quote. So there's not a lot there, but it certainly stirs the pot. And for a bit of context that kind of adds intrigue here, it's important to note that Blinken made those comments a few days after Senator Marco Rubio made his own headlines by telling CBS that he has concerns that if federal investigators probing the Trump assassination attempts were to find evidence of a foreign hand, he has concerns they might try to suppress that information out of concern that publicizing such information could be like putting a finger on the scale of the November 5 presidential election. We'll be tracking uh, this situation at threat status. Another development this week that's been on my radar, Ben, in a very big way, was the release by Republicans on both the House Select Committee on the Strategic Competition between the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party and the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. They put out a joint investigative report in which they outline how China's ruling CCP is, as they say, it exploiting U.S. government-funded research and partnerships between American and Chinese universities, including some with explicit links to the Chinese military, to gain uh, backdoor, quote, backdoor access, end quote, to insights on advanced technology breakthroughs. 
The report homes in specifically on the transfer of technology research with sensitive defense applications. It shows evidence of hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. federal research funding over the last decade, essentially helping the CCP achieve advancements in dual use, critical and emerging technologies like hypersonic weapons, artificial intelligence, fourth generation nuclear weapons technology and semiconductor technology. This is a really sensitive issue at U.S. universities, Ben. The issue of joint institutes that exist uh, in China and involve scholars and money from top American research schools and the fact that grant money from the Pentagon and the U.S. intelligence community is involved. Uh, It's important to note here that the report does not say anything explicitly illegal has happened, but basically argues that Congress should be putting serious guardrails around this kind of sensitive research, especially when it involves grant money from DOD or U.S. intelligence agencies. It's also interesting to note that Georgia Tech Uh, recently divested from its joint institute in China, and that upon the release of this congressional investigation this week, there were indications that UC Berkeley uh, is now also divesting from a joint institute uh, in China. I personally uh, wrote on the report uh, for the Washington Times. I also moderated a live discussion with the two committee chairs, uh, John Molinar and Virginia Fox, that oversaw this investigation, Ben, that was at an event held this week at the International Spy Museum in Washington that was co-sponsored by the Alexander Hamilton Society. People can read my article and watch the video of the event on the Washington Times website. It was also covered by C-SPAN. It's an important issue, and you're at the forefront of it, and it's certainly appreciated. I'd encourage everybody to go check that out. One of the things on my radar, guys, this political uproar that's kind of unfolding before our eyes right now as we're recording over Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's visit this week to an ammunition factory in my home state of Pennsylvania. This factory makes some uh, munitions that Ukraine is using in its war with Russia. But Zelensky was joined at the event by several key Pennsylvania Democrats, including apparently Governor Josh Shapiro. And Republicans are casting this as a a political event, essentially saying that Democrats are using Zelensky to try to help their prospects in a key battleground state, potentially the, the pivotal battleground state in the race between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. In fact, Speaker House Speaker Mike Johnson, just minutes before we started recording here on Wednesday afternoon, called for Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S., Oksana Markarova, to be fired for her role in helping to organize the event and bringing Zelensky to Pennsylvania in the first place. So this is unfolding sort of breaking news as we're recording here in the podcast, but this is something we're going to keep a close eye on because once again, Volodymyr Zelensky is uh, at at the center of U.S. domestic politics. Now, as I said at the outset, we're going to have a good deep dive coming up on uh, Israel and Hezbollah, but I want to drill down on a, a more specific angle to this story first, and that's U.S. involvement in the Middle East. I examined this question in the Washington Times this week and highlighted how President Biden is leaving office in some ways, just like his two predecessors did, deeper in the Middle East than when he started. It happened to Barack Obama, who ended up committing the U.S. to a major multinational campaign to battle ISIS, a campaign that's still going on today, and dispatching new military resources to Syria, Iraq, and elsewhere in the region. Donald Trump and his pledge to end forever wars. He made good on some of those promises, but there were more American forces in the Mideast when he left than when he came to power. And that was largely because of Iran, of course, and how close those two countries, the U.S. and Iran, came to all-out war in 2020. And now Joe Biden. All three of those presidents, Obama, Trump, and Biden, wanted to move away from the Middle East and reorient troops to the Indo-Pacific, to China specifically. And we've certainly done that to some degree, but Look, here we are again with history kind of repeating itself. This week, around the same time, actually, that President Biden was talking at the United Nations General Assembly in New York City and pleading for de-escalation between Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, we learned that the Pentagon sending a fresh detachment of troops to the region. We'll now have about 40,000 there, 6,000 more, roughly, than the usual number, that relatively stable number that we'd seen before the October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israel. We've dispatched carrier strike groups, fighter jets, troops, all kinds of other military resources, both as a show of support for Israel, also to conduct our own operations, which we've talked about here in the show extensively. We're leading a campaign to fight the Houthis in Yemen to keep them from disrupting commercial ships. We're periodically striking militias in Iraq and Syria, shooting down Iranian missiles and drones when they're fired at Israel. We tried to build a dock to deliver food and humanitarian supplies 
to civilians in Gaza. So we're doing a lot. We're still knee deep in this region that we try to get out of. And there's concern on Capitol Hill and in some national security circles, Guy, that we might be doing some medium and long term damage to ourselves here. Friend of the show, Mark Cancian of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, he came on the podcast a few months ago and just told me flatly when I asked that the U.S. today cannot win a two front war. We don't have the resources for it. Now, it doesn't seem like the U.S. would find itself in a serious, massive ground war in the Middle East. But what if the region keeps sucking up resources? What does that mean for our ability to wage war in the Pacific if we need to? Defense News had a good breakdown this week, I thought, of some of the costs associated with this, because as we all know, money tells a lot of the story in Washington. The $95 billion funding bill that President Biden signed back in April, the one with money for Ukraine, Israel, and other priorities, had an extra $2.4 billion in money for U.S. Central Command, which oversees American military activities in the Mideast. That money is just about gone if it's not gone already. And now we have another troop surge coming on top of it. So this is really expensive in terms of money and potentially costly in terms of military readiness in other key theaters. But there's one more element I want to mention quickly, and that's the messaging aspect of all of this. When I spoke to retired General Kenneth McKenzie, the former head of Central Command, a few weeks ago, he said something that really stuck with me, and he called this whole idea of you know pivoting to Asia, which began during the Obama administration, announcing to the world that we're lessening our military footprint in the Mideast, moving assets to Pacific. He called that, quote, sophomoric, unquote, and said it was a mistake to make such public proclamations. And he didn't say this explicitly, but I think one of the, the underlying reasons that that's true is you're inevitably forced to go back on your word like we are right now pouring more money and manpower into the Middle East as usual with no clear metrics for when we're getting out or any kind of timeline. So the long and short of it is, Guy, you know, we're talking about a, a presidential campaign that we're nearing the end of. And I, I personally hope that whether it's Donald Trump or Kamala Harris who wins the presidency, I hope neither of them make any grand promises or grand proclamations about how the U.S. is going to get out of the Middle East because we're not. And we are joined now by Avi Malamed. He is a former Israeli intelligence official who went on to serve as deputy and then as a senior Arab affairs advisor to multiple Jerusalem mayors and author of Inside the Middle East, Entering a New Era. And he's also the founder of the Inside the Middle East Institute. Avi, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Hi, Ben. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Wanted to start um, with this idea of of escalation with regard to Israel and, and and Hezbollah. There's a lot of focus here in the U.S. and there has been really ever since October seventh in preventing escalation. President Biden made that kind of a, a cornerstone piece of his speech to the UN this week that that's still the overarching goal or one of the the overarching goals from the U.S. perspective. But you know, as you look at what's going on now, especially in the wake of the, the the pager operation, which we'll get into a little bit more later, you know, you've got major back and forth strikes between the two sides. Hezbollah targeting Tel Aviv, apparently targeting Mossad headquarters. Three hundred rockets fired at northern Israel just today, as we record this. Israel's launching more strikes. So, from where you sit, is escalation already here? Number one, and number two. If Israel's goal is to destroy or at least significantly degrade Hezbollah, do they does Israel need to launch a major ground operation to do that, or can they accomplish it at this point through airstrikes and intelligence operations? Well, indeed, the escalation is already taking place on the ground, and it may be further escalate, maybe leading to a place of like a total war, which is very possible, but it's not necessarily, at least at this point, it's not inevitable. And as for the question uh, about the um, the Israeli uh, causing this um, damage to Hezbollah, look, the Israeli government says uh, formally the objective is to enable Israeli citizens who have became the northern communities of Israel who became refugees because of the attacks of Hezbollah since October 7, to enable them to go back to their home safely, meaning that they will not any longer live under the threat of Hezbollah. Now, there is a United Nations Security Council, 1701 and 1557, that actually orders the Lebanese government to deploy the Lebanese army along the border and orders Hezbollah to stay north of the Litani River. Those instructions remain on the paper because Hezbollah is the real boss in Lebanon. 
The bottom line of this whole situation is that now Israel is determined to end the skirmish with Hezbollah and enable to, to the Israeli citizens to go back home safely. And there are two paths to do that. One is using a force, including, if needed, a ground military invasion. And the other way is the diplomatic way. So right now, because there are many moving parts to this whole story, the story of the Iranians, the story of the Biden administration, the upcoming elections in the States, the issue in Gaza Strip, there are many moving parts. So we cannot say decisively at this moment which direction is we are leaning towards. But I would say definitely, as I said before, we are in the midst of, esca- midst of escalation. We could expect further escalation. A scenario of a all-out war is very possible, but at this point yet, it is not inevitable. Is the Israeli military, from your point of view, ready for that? I mean, given how given what, you know they've been now operating in, in, in Gaza against Hamas for, for going on a year now, is from a military just preparedness standpoint, do you think Israel would be ready for a full-scale war with Hezbollah? Well, look, if I'm listening to the strong uh, statements by the Israeli um, top uh, military commanders, including just recently the chief of staff, uh, 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 Lieutenant General Herzl Alevi, they basically said very clearly, we are preparing a huge uh, capacities. We have not yet used those capacities. We will use those capacities. I would say that uh, given to the performances of the Israeli defense forces during the war in Gaza Strip, and I'm not only talking about the airstrikes, I'm mostly talking about the, the warfare, warfare on the ground itself, uh, where the Israeli troops have performed uh, outstandingly, so to speaking. I, I would basically assume that Israel does have the capacities, the abilities, the means in order to conduct a wide-scale invasion in South Lebanon. That being said, obviously, we should remember that Hezbollah is a very tough um, rivalry. This is an uh, organization that gained a lot of military experience in the war in Syria and other places. I don't think that there is anyone in Israel who uh, look lightly at the challenge ahead. Okay, one more quickly, and then I want to bring Guy into the conversation. I I do want to turn to the the, the pager operation, the apparent Israeli uh, pager attack, which targeted Hezbollah and took out key figures in the group and caused a lot of damage. There were reports just in Israeli media today, I was reading before we came on, that the operation may have taken out as many as 1,500 uh, Hezbollah fighters. So operationally, it looks like it was hugely effective. But from the intel side of this, two questions for you. Number one is, how do they actually pull this off? There seems to be a lot of questions still about where some of these components were made, how they got explosive material into them, other other murky details. But number two, given how complex and difficult this has to have been to, to have pulled off, do you think Israel might have had any kind of, of outside help in getting this done? Well, I mean, I wouldn't rule out anything. I mean, you know, Israel maintain an intelligence intelligence cooperation with different agencies from the region and outside the region, um, particularly when we are looking at senior leaders of the Hezbollah, like, for example, Ibrahim and Akil that was eliminated last week. We have to remember that these some of those people have been wanted formally by the United States for their role of killing Americans. So definitely, I would say that I would expect there is a very strong intelligence and operational cooperation in some of the cases. I want to remind us the elimination of uh, of Hezbollah's uh, senior leader a couple of years ago, already back then in 2006, when he was eliminated, a person that was really wanted by the United States. And, um, and I think that he was eliminated in Damascus. And so... I think that you could expect that there has been uh, ongoing in, uh, uh, cooperation, uh, including, as I said before, in the regional level, because there are agencies in the level in the region that has a lot of capacities and um, accessibility towards uh, inside uh, informers and information and so on. So this is one aspect of that. As for the the operation itself, I know that you know, understandably, people are looking at the very sensational. A feature of something like that, which is very sensational. And um, but I think that um, from an intelligence perspective, I think that it's important to note this couple of things. This is something that has been built up for years. This is not something that happens overnight. It's been built up for years. Obviously, it involves a lot of capacities, technologically, human resources. But these are things that I kind of like put under the umbrella of logistics and technologies and so on. But what I think is really interesting to think about from an intelligence perspective is that what we are looking at is a very carefully, thoroughly 
meticulously uh, tailored chess game that has been done in a in a long term process. And one of the interesting things to think about it when you think about something like from an operational perspective, you need to have the ability not only to plan your five moves ahead, but also to plan your five moves ahead in a way that they will be dialoguing with the rivalry's moves. And in order to be able to do that, you need to know what the rivalry's move are going to be like. And but this is not enough. You need to have for each and every move, you need to have plan A, plan B, and plan C, plan C, just to be able to adjust yourself to things that happens on the ground that did not anticipate it. So I would say that the real, I would say, stunning perspective of this thing that has been sold for many years is exactly that. Avi, it's Guy Taylor. On the exploding pager operation, as we sit here today, what's your best estimate of the the damage that this operation did to Hezbollah? Help us unpack that a little bit. I mean, but also the broader Iran-backed axis of resistance, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, militias in Iraq and Syria. We're talking about physical, tam- tangible damage, but what about the psychological aspect of it? If you're one of these groups, are you now questioning who you can trust? Help us unpack that a little bit. Yes, that's definitely one of the most substantial impacts of something like that. You know, for Hezbollah, it's even tripled because Hezbollah has plan A and plan B, plan C for his communication system and commanding system. When he was using the mobile, the, 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 the cell phone system, he realized quite quickly that Israel has the ability to penetrate that three system and during the last couple of months, Israel was eliminating hundreds of Hezbollah's militants and, and field commanders. So Hezbollah switched to Plan B. Plan B was the story of the pages. Uh, but that system also comes to be known as unreliable and even becoming a Trojan horse in the case of Hezbollah. One other thing that we should notice is in the context of the elimination of the leadership of the Radwan force last week in Beirut. That was not something that has to do with neither the cell phone nor the pager system. And so at this point, when you're looking at the Hezbollah situation from that perspective, is its control and communication systems are penetrated, are breached, which for every uh, military entity, this is a nightmare with all the ramifications that come along with it. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is, as you said, psychologically in the sense, look, um, in the Middle East, in our tough neighborhood, the name of the game is not only deterrence, it's also image of deterrence. And when the image of deterrence is currently crumbling, you are in a bad situation. I can tell you that right now, across the Arab world, there is a very strong mockery, sense of mockery of the Hezbollah, which, by the way, has a lot of ramifications, including in the context of the op- you know, modus operandi of the organization, because the need to restore and reestablish crumbling image of deterrence and restore deterrence itself sometimes can be so powerful that even if you are in an under uh, you have the under end condition you may try to do something even desperate to try and to restore it so this is yet another significant impact of this whole story. I want to shift gears actually a little bit uh for time here it's reported I think Reuters news agency had it first that Iran has brokered ongoing secret talks between Russia and uh, Yemen's Houthi rebels to transfer anti-ship missiles to the Houthis. This seems to underscore Tehran's deepening ties to Moscow. We talk on this podcast often about the axis of authoritarians and the danger that that poses to the United States and its allies. But I'm curious how you see this uh, news development from the Israeli perspective. I mean, if Russia is in fact considering transferring P-800 Onyx anti-ship missiles to the Houthis, how would Israel view that? Well, it's beyond Israel. It's how the region views that and how the international community views that. You um, well, you mentioned earlier, rightly, the whole story of the axis of resistance. We should bear in mind that for the last year, Houthis has been basically damaging global trade by attacking ships in the Red Sea and the Babylon and Mandab Strait. And so, obviously, if something like that materialized, which basically I would currently at this point look at it uh, very cautiously, 
but if something like that is materializing, obviously we are looking at an, an, an excessive threat to, uh, to the global trade and international, not only regional, but also international stability. Uh, we do also have to bear in mind the role of the Chinese, even though the Chinese are very careful with providing their advanced missiles. Uh, but we know, we know that some of the Chinese advanced missiles uh, showed to sea, for example, made their way to Hezbollah, and it used those missiles. So I would look at these reports cautiously on the one hand, but on the other hand, it again re-emphasizes a thing that I have been, when others were, have been talking about, I wrote about it extensively in my previous books when I was talking about this challenge of the axis of resistance, uh, the challenge it presents not only to regional stability, but to global stability. And that has been clearly uh, proved to be accurate uh, analysis and prediction when we see what happened in the region for the last uh, for the last year. Egypt uh, is is uh, dramatically impacted, and, and and its its economy sustained severe damage because of the attacks of the Houthis. Yet Egypt, who enormously has been building one of the biggest naval powers in the world in the last couple of years. Uh, Egyptian military fleet is estimated to be the fourth in its size uh, to secure their interest both in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean and in the Red Sea. Egypt up until now remained um, on the sidelines, sort of speaking, in, in, despite of the damage it sustained, economic damage from the story of the Houthis. I would guess that the Egyptians always, also, as you mentioned before, Guy, will look at something like that, not very favorably, so of speaking. So we are looking at a development that already happens on the ground. Avi, one last thing to, to close us out here. I think you're maybe in a, a unique position to, to address this. I'm just curious where you think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu stands right now in terms of his relationship with top defense and intelligence officials. I mean, it's you know we've obviously plenty seen plenty of news reports about clashes he's had with with Benny Gantz, the former defense minister and member of his, his war cabinet. There have been reports of, of fights between Netanyahu and the current defense minister, Yoav Gallant, shouting matches and meetings. Even key figures in the IDF over the past couple of months have seemed to contradict Netanyahu at certain points, saying that Hamas can't actually be physically destroyed in the way that Netanyahu's promised. You know, from where you sit and the positions that, that you've been in, is is this normal? Is this just kind of par for the course in Israeli politics and when it comes to Netanyahu specifically and his relationships with other key players uh, in the Israeli government, defense and intelligence circles? Or or do you think that there might be an unhealthy and, and maybe in a worst case scenario, even dangerous level of, of dysfunction here? Well, I'm not a military historian, but I do know, best of my knowledge, that in the past, there used to be always in a situation like that of tension or war, there used to be always like tough debate, sometimes even not only tough debate, more than that, within Israeli supreme military and political establishment. Obviously, this time in the context of Netanyahu, everything is boosted because of the, of the political crisis in Israel, reminding you the whole crisis started way before October 7. But what we see in the last, I would say, roughly speaking, since the escalation with Hezbollah, I think that what we see is, relatively speaking, the inner political tensions have been calmed down or pushed aside for now. Uh, you may recall that only a week ago, everybody was talking about what seems to be like inevitably the ousting of uh, Minister of Defense Gallant and the, and the nomination of Gidon Saar as the new Minister of Defense. That is off the table. Uh, also, what we see is that Gantz gave a very strong support for the Israeli military move uh, against Hezbollah. We hear the very decisive statements by the military establishment regarding the need to move forcefully in Lebanon to neutralize Hezbollah. So you see that in all those aspects that were kind of like uh, loaded, sort of speaking, in terms of the discussion within the Israeli uh, supreme leaders of political and military leadership, uh, now you see this sense of uh, calmness, and I would expect that to continue, at least for the visible future. Avi Malamed, thank you so much for joining us here in the show. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Avi. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.
And it's time now for Threats of the Week, our weekly segment here in the show where a guy and I each identify a threat, whether it's uh, here at home somewhere or in a corner of the world that we think is impacting U.S. national security right now this week as you're listening to the show. And guy, I am going to stay closer to home this week because my Threat of the Week is U.S. air traffic control systems. Our colleague Brad Matthews wrote this week in the Washington Times about an incident last week when a United Airlines flight had to suddenly slow down while descending towards San Francisco International Airport to avoid hitting another plane. Two passengers were injured in the maneuver. United Flight 2428 last Thursday dropped its speed of descent after systems in the plane alerted the pilots they had to make a move to avoid hitting the other plane. And the FAA just noted all of this in a report filed this week. Two of the passengers were hurt, one seriously, the other with very minor injuries. Thankfully, nobody was killed. And we don't know all the details exactly that led to this, but it comes against a pretty disturbing backdrop. There was a new report out from the Government Accountability Office this week citing data from the Federal Aviation Administration, which says that nearly two-thirds of its 138 air traffic control systems are either unsustainable or potentially unsustainable. That's citing outdated functionality, a lack of spare parts available, and a lot of other issues. At least 58 of those unsustainable systems, quote, have critical operational impacts on the safety and efficiency of the national airspace, unquote. Now, there are some modernization projects in the works, but they're moving slowly. Some of those projects won't be complete for another decade or more. The FAA doesn't have plans to modernize some of the systems, three of which are more than 30 years old. So this is all obviously very expensive and very complex. We take a lot of it for granted, Guy. I know you you travel a lot. You're in airports a lot. I do too. I think as Americans, we probably don't fully appreciate the amount of time, effort, manpower, money, and expertise that goes into these air traffic control systems. But Man, right now, it looks like a threat because if these fixes aren't made soon, I do fear we're going to see more incidents like the near tragedy in San Francisco. That's certainly disturbing, Ben. Uh, Imagine if we lived in a part of the world where no investigation of such systems was occurring. And if it was occurring, it wasn't ever made public the way it has been here in the United States. Actually, Ben, your threat uh, dovetails nicely with my own threat of the week this week, which is that in-air security on airplanes may be in real danger because of exhaustion and other factors involving the federal air marshals program this came up at a congressional hearing this week ben where john casaretti president of the air marshal association told a panel of the house homeland security committee that the marshals are overworked and leaving the agency at an alarming rate, and they are actually seeking a new agency to house them. The publication Government Executive covered the hearing, Ben. I encourage people to go find Government Executive's article on it. And so my threat of the week is that in-air security could be dropping off dramatically with little media attention at a moment when there are reports of ongoing terrorism threats to the United States. A lot of this stuff uh, we don't think about or or read too much about until uh, there's massive incidents, until it's too late. So hopefully we address some of these threats uh, ahead of time. Thank you all so much for listening. Once again, Guy, thank you for joining me. Huge thanks again to Avi Malamed for joining us here on the show this week. So please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, share with all of your friends, and we'll be back next week on the Threat Status Podcast. 